but what do you think the greatest threat is to the church in our generation? It's pastors. <laughs> Honestly. The pastors. Anywhere, God has given three offices, I believe, to the church. Evangelist, pastor, and teacher. Wherever you see a weak church, you see these weak men. Either they're non-existent, they're unbiblical, or they're unconverted. And all this talk about the judgment on our country because of its immoralities and everything else, never forget judgment always begins with the household of God. And um, I am astounded at the lack of the fear of the Lord and the lack of biblical knowledge among those who would call themselves the ministers of Christ. And um, I mean, the atrocities that have happened in America in evangelicalism, just in the pulpit itself, the tomfoolery, the lack of reverence. If you have a church that's not a praying church, it's because you, you have non-praying elders. Um, the church is not biblical. It's because you have non-biblical elders. It always goes back to... So when I look at the nation, I'm not blaming some party or professors or this or that. I'm looking at myself as a minister of Christ. And, and that's a very solemn... That, that's why someone shouldn't enter into the ministry very lightly. And, you know, we could say all kinds of other things, but it all does come back to that. We could say liberalism, which is true. We could say even a greater, more dangerous thing that's a secret, hidden liberalism is when men affirm that the Bible is inerrant, but their whole ministry is nothing but pragmatism. All you young men need to understand something. All this talk about Reformation the last 15 years. The Reformers didn't want to be Reformers. They just wanted to be Biblical, number one. Number two, you're not Reformed simply because you've adopted an academic view of some sort of sovereign grace soteriology. You're following in the spirit of the Reformers because you're trying to take every aspect of your thought your doctrine, your disposition, your life, your family, your church, and submitting it to what is written. And, and so those are some of the things. Greetings. This is the eighth message on the Calvinistic Methodist and the fourth message on the life, ministry, and impact of Daniel uh, Rowland. And, and I have to tell you, I'm in absolutely no rush to get through this. In other words, if if Daniel Rowland's ministry could be represented as a as a wet rag, then I want to I want to you know I want to twist that rag with as much force as I can to get every drop of spiritual truth out of the ministry and so that's kind of you know that's kind of like my heart and that's the direction that we're going so we're this week what we're going to do is we're going to look at the sermon christ is all in all we'll look at the first point that daniel roland makes um, we are going to i'm going to tie together the opening uh, question and answer session and the response that paul washer gave to Daniel Rowland, and this kind of falls under the category of the impact of Rowland's ministry, even to this very day, so I want to give an example of it. And then we're going to end with a brief prayer. So first, regarding the opening, Paul Washer 
many years ago, quite passionately, really was crying out for revival. He said, you know, he was tired or fatigued of reading about men who wrote about men who knew somebody that knew God intimately. He desired to know God intimately and have greater communion with God than what he was experiencing at the time. You know, in other words, very much like you see the relationship between God and Moses, where Moses said to God, God, take me into your counsel. And it's that level of intimacy, right? And I'm defining revival as a greater presence of God. That, that's what we're saying, rent, Isaiah, rend the heavens, Lord, and come down. That's what we're saying, you know. It's Moses saying when, you know, when you look at Exodus and God is in our midst walking through the camp, you know. That's what we're talking about. It is a special outpouring of the Holy Spirit. So we're not asking for the effects of the revival. We're asking the person who created heaven and earth, God himself, to be in our presence at a far greater level or intimacy than what we're experiencing today. It's, it's, a, it's a child crying out to his father, Father, we need you. Okay? And that is an old school definition of revival. And so Paul Washer just quite passionately said, you know, I, I'm reading about these men. I know that they I know that uh, God worked in a mighty way in the intimacy that they had with God. And he desires the very same thing. A few years after that, he speaks about a biography that has a great impact on him. And the biography is the one that you see in front of you. It's the biography of Daniel Rowland and the, and the Great Awakening of the 18th Century by Mr. Evans. Now, this book, as I recall, was published uh, in 1982 by Banner of Truth. Now, today, I want to share, you know, there's good news and bad news. The good news is, you can, from Banner, you can buy J.C. Ryle's work of the Christian leaders of the 18th century that includes a biography on Daniel Rowland. You can get that today. There's the two-volume set of the Calvinistic Methodist Fathers that Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones just devoured. You know, you can buy that today. I mean, you know, it's it's really an, an exhaustive um research of on the Calvinistic Methodists and it contains many biographies. So if you're a pastor, particularly I want to speak to you, especially after that opening, and, and your heart is a bit a bit dry, um, you know that you know that perhaps you've you made the mistake of of your emphasis is not on Christ, but helping people modify their behavior. You know, that it's become all pragmatism, you know. Uh, within within your preaching that you're not you're you've turned Christianity into a teaching and it's no longer a personal relationship with Christ you know um, and so you need something to stir your heart to show you the way to remind you perhaps of how you began your ministry um, and maybe just time and the pressures have gotten the best of you well reading good biographies uh, will will help point you in the right direction so I want to recommend those and, you know, let me put it straightforwardly. If you're a Baptist, then read a biography on Charles Spurgeon if, if, or John Bunyan. There you go, you know. And if you're Methodist, yeah, go with the Calvinistic Methodist. But, you know, even look at uh, Wesley's works, uh, just a great man of God. And if you're a Presbyterian, well, then I, I certainly would go back and look at, at Mr. Calvin. And he'll point you in the right direction. And so going back to the founders of your denomination about how you began, you're going to find that these men honor Christ, just like Daniel Rowland did, okay? So Paul Washer is just immensely blessed by this biography. Now the thing is, because it's out of print, and because it's a very good biography, scarcity drives price. So if you go to Amazon, you'll find that this biography typically sells for around 100 bucks. I'm sorry, if you go to eBay, it typically sells for about 100 bucks. And Amazon, I tend to find it like like 200, 250. I've seen it as high as $500 a copy. Now, 
What's interesting is I, I made this known to Banner when I attended their conference. I had the blessing of speaking to somebody in their finance department, just a solid Christian brother, and I pointed this out to him that um, I'm sure they have many different priorities and projects and things, but I would republish this book because there's certainly a demand for it. And one of the things, and if they don't do it between now and the time where um, I raise um, some coin, um, one of the things that I'm go personally going to do is find out from Banner, what does it cost to republish a book? I mean, even if it's 100 copies or, or 250 copies, you know, is it is it is it five thousand dollars? Is it ten? Is it fifteen? You know, what, what what's the minimum that's required to get this book back in circulation and at least do something right so that you can buy this book for thirty five bucks versus three hundred fifty dollars? Um, and if you if you think I'm kidding, like I said, go to eBay and go to Amazon this very day, and you'll see you'll go, wow, this is this is an expensive book. So now. So I'm personally taking that as a as an objective, okay, and I and and I I don't need anybody's help in, in achieving that, okay. So you're never going to hear me ask for money, okay. This it's not not the purpose of the way. So, but if you're a Christian brother or sister and you're you're uh, well off and you have a a burden like I have for this. And you want to run with my idea and contact Banner and say, hey, I got a gift for you. What does it take to republish this book? Well, I won't be offended. Okay. <laughs> so, because I think there's such a sense of urgency, you know, to do these kind of things because this biography for not just for, um, not just for Christians, but for Christian pastors and Christian leaders. Um, I, I just, I think a book like this will be immensely valuable in the hands of, of, uh, of Christian leaders today, okay? So that's how it ties. So when Paul Washer is speaking about the, uh, uh, you know, giving his response about pastors, uh, well, what, what, is he, what is he calling pastors back to? Well, back to the faithfulness and preaching the gospel and fulfilling the ministry that they've been called into as an example would be Reverend Daniel Rowland. And I just wanted to point out that Roland's ministry, even after what, 300 years, it, it is still having an impact this very day because Paul Washer was certainly impacted by Roland's biography that you see here in presence. Okay, so that's how it all ties together. And Paul Washer's response also shows, man, we really do need ministers like Daniel Roland this very day. And the... Um, the spiritual challenges that we face today, the darkness, um, just all the things that Washer meant. And, and again, point out that he also ended up by saying some of these things. So if I was a pastor, would I be very concerned? Oh, absolutely, about, about how I'm spending my time, what am I preaching, am I doing Christ-honoring preaching, or am I just teaching Christianity as a methodology or as a teaching and those kinds of things? What about my personal prayer life? Do I have the intimacy? Am I seeking the things for of God, you know, really? Um, but also, I just want to point out that he did say these were some of the things, right? So in other words, um, there's a, a thread of responsibility that goes through the congregation. Um, and so I, I just simply, I think it's just fair to recognize that you start preaching like like Roland, you are going to likely be attacked. Um, because remember, right now, ministers are trying to figure out, there's so few people attending churches, they're trying to figure out how to appeal to people's flesh, whether they want to admit it or not, to get them to come to church. Oh, hey, let me show you how kind we are. Let me show you, um, you know, we've made our um, uh, Sunday morning um, uh, uh you know, Sunday morning gatherings, more like a concert, you know, kind of sense feeling. And we're doing a, we have better, you know, uh, sound systems and, and we have lights and all that kind of stuff. And, and our, and our teaching is very, you know, applicable today because we're going to help you become a better mother and father and, and things of that nature. So where Roland is coming along saying, no, no, he, he's preaching about the wrath of God is to come. 
and but he's giving the the balm of Gilead, right? The blood of Christ. He's 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 doing both. So he he preaches the law in order to drive people to Christ, and and well, that's vastly different than what you're doing today, isn't it? And and so as a minister, I want to tell you straight up, yeah, you, you you begin to preach and you begin to allow the Spirit to lead you, to take you back to the very beginning, to to be like the um, the fathers of your denomination. Um, assuming that they were solid uh, Christian men, you will be attacked. Like Daniel Rowland one time, a man came and he was going to kill him. Okay? So Daniel Rowland's going to preach and a man's going to come and kill him. And he brings his rifle and he takes aim. And fortunately, the rifle uh, did not fire. It misfired. And so th this is the type of hostility that Daniel Rowland faced during his ministry. So yeah, it it there you, you could get fired for preaching the gospel. You know, it, it can happen because if your church elders are very successful American businessmen, um, the gospel is a very scary message because really what's happening is we're preaching messages um, that really are meant to modify people's behavior. We're more concerned about people's behavior than their salvation. Um, and, and I'll give some examples of that as, as time goes on. So, uh, so again, I just wanted to kind of give some, some glimpses of, of, of Roland's opposition, but also, too, again, the, the impact and the value of good Christian biographies. And I think this is one that should be a priority. There's many good biographies out there. You can find many of them on Banner of Truth, of course, many others. A Lloyd-Jones two-set volume is very good. But you know, every preacher that you could think of, there's wonderful biographies today. And I just want to encourage pastors, especially after Ro uh, Washer's uh, response, is, it, yeah, let's be honest with God about what we're doing. Um, let's of our shortcomings. L let's be honest about our sins. That Christ isn't enough for us, which is why we're using our personality um, and uh, just just our carnal abilities versus feeding people and showing people Christ in the Scriptures. Uh, we've lost confidence in the Word of God, so there's much to confess and admit to. Uh, but but I want to also though give a remedy, and that remedy is along with being faithful and reading the scriptures is reading good biographies you know so reading the scriptures reading good biographies reading old sermons reading works on theology reading about church history particularly revivals having a good diet of reading of those variety of topics uh, i think will be immensely helpful to you okay all right so let's go let i so i think i think i've covered that well enough now let's look at daniel's sermon this is a second sermon that says, Christ is all in all. This comes from Hebrews chapter 1, verse 9. Now, again, I want to remind everybody, like if you want to know, hey, John, I want to know what a good Christian sermon looks like. Well, I view Hebrews as a Christian sermon. And so if you want to know, and if you read it, if I, you know, if you read it can, throughout, I think it takes about 45 minutes, by the way. So I would imagine it, to preach it, would probably be more closer to an hour and 15 minutes, maybe an hour and a half. Um, but but there, Hebrews is a Christ-honoring sermon. So if you're looking for an example of one, there you go. All right. And the, But the verse that Daniel Rowland is contending with is, Therefore God, even thy God, has anointed thee with the oil of gladness above thy fellows. And Roland begins right away with defining things. He says, well, you know, what does it mean, God, even thy God? Well, we are to understand that, Roland says, is God the Father. And well, what, what, what about um, the oil of gladness? What, what, how are we to understand that? And Roland says, well, th that is meant here to be the Holy Spirit. And that's to hearken us back to remember the mission statement that Luke gives us by quoting the Old Testament, when Christ says, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor, he has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, and end recovery of the sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. 
And he goes on to say that, you know, he goes, he, when you speak about the work of the Holy Spirit, you know, the Holy Spirit is compared to water because it cleanses us. He says at other times, the Holy Spirit is compared to fire because it purifies us. But in this case, referring to the Holy Spirit as oil, it's meant um, to show the work of the Spirit to soften our hearts, to make our yoke easy, Roland argues. And Roland's going to make a very important point here about the fact that Christ was called, he was anointed by God the Father to do these things. He says here, God the Father has anointed thee, God the Son, the oil of gladness, God the Holy Spirit above thy fellows. And he says the fellows is indeed the Christian church. And so uh, Roland is going to have three parts, uh, three points in this sermon. Uh, I'm going to give you the three parts, but we're only going to deal with point number one. What is meant by the anointing spoken? God has anointed thee. Point one. Point two, the end of which our Lord was anointed. And point three, the lesson it teaches and the blessings we reap. So he's going to say that the Savior of the world has been set apart for the great work of redemption. That's why Christ came into this world. And he's going to also point out, you know, I want to hearken back to, you know, um, his sermon on free grace. Do you remember the thief on the cross? Roland makes these kind of points that I think are often missed in today's preaching. You know, the thief on the cross just wanted to be remembered. Jesus, will you remember me when you enter your kingdom, you know? Now, I understand the implication of it, but will you remember me? But Christ exceeds that, right? I mean, he doesn't just say, yeah, I'm going to remember you. He says, you're going to be with me. You're going to be with me in my kingdom this very day. You see? I mean, that's how our Lord works, right? I mean, he exceeds more than what we can ask. These are the kind of points. This is the kind of Christ-honoring preaching that Daniel Rowland provides. So he goes on to say, he said, you know, that he points out that Christ did not take this by force. God the Father anointed thee to fulfill the mission that we read from Luke, right? And so he said, Christ did not come into this world and take this by force. No, God the Father appointed thee. Um, you know, so he says here, Christ himself thus said, I am not come of myself, but he who sent me is true, whom you know not. All right. So Peter says in his sermon, right, in, in Acts, that the house of Israel um, says here that uh, that God uh, made th that same Jesus whom they had crucified, both Lord and Christ. So, I mean, that's Peter's point, right? I mean, who, who did this? Who appointed thee? Who, who made Jesus the Savior of the world? Who made Jesus the Lord and the Christ? Well, well, it's God the Father. And he'll go on to say that, um, he'll point out that Christ didn't lose focus, right? I mean, when you read about Christ in the Gospels, he's determined, he's marching towards the cross. Even the fact that his apostles uh, don't want him to, but he knows what his mission is. And so, but, but here is an, a simple example Roland provides where a young man comes to him and says, uh, uh, you know, has a request and says, hey, listen, Divide the inheritance between uh, him and his brother. That's what he was asking for. Jesus, I'm having a problem with my brother, and I want you to be the judge. Now, uh, Jesus, of course, the great physician, could also be the great judge, and he could have addressed this matter, but he did not. Why? Because uh, that wasn't his mission. His mission was to come into this world to be the great physician, um, to heal the brokenhearted, to set the captives free. Um, this 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 matter uh, it was not why he came into this world. It's not why he was appointed. Uh, Christ is is sticking to the mission that God the Father has given him. And and Roland is going to give you know this analogy. He says you know um, he kept referring to Jesus within his allotted sphere and exceeded not the bounds of his own province. You know, he goes on to say, um, uh, what is it that uh, to thee follow thou me, cease to pry on others' concerns, be diligent in thine own calling. So Roland will go on to say, when a river gently glides along its um, its channels, it waters are clear and wholesome, but when it overflows its banks, it often commits great da damage. Uh, within, uh, we keep within the limits assigned us, 
we prosper and succeed. When we stray from the path of duty and exceed the bounds of our own calling, we generally go wrong and do great mischief. It would be well uh, were all to follow our blessed Savior as as this example, as well as their teacher, to be content with our lot and useful in their stations. So, uh, you know. So I'm sorry if I'm, my reading wasn't very clear on this, but 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 I just simply wanted to make the point. You know, Roland is saying, listen, you, you've got a river, and it, it's 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 you know it's got a shoreline doesn't it right and you stay and the river stays within within its boundaries but if it exceeds that right well it causes great damage if there's a flood right so as christian people as the christian church we need to stay within the framework of of what our mission has um, what god has given for our mission which is to preach christ and him crucified that is our mission that is our purpose and when the prime, when secondary issues or even third issues uh, take over the primary issue, well, then we have lost our way and we've caused great damage. And this kind of again goes back to Paul Washer's point and why we need men, ministers called into the ministry uh, that actually been called. So it's not good enough to say, oh, I want to serve the Lord. I want to be of some help. Well, we all do. And that's good. But but being a minister is a special calling. It's an anointing that God himself does. And so, um, so what a tragic thing it is for somebody to go beyond uh, what God has called them to do. And so, but likewise, when you look at the church uh, as a whole, if, if we go beyond what God has called us to do, well, then we lose our primary purpose and we grieve the Holy Spirit is what I'm suggesting. And so, um, so Roland is going to give some examples of this. And so he says, you know, when he's speaking to Moses, he's tell, Moses, listen, you're going to go tell the people. And, and when Moses, asked, who should I say sent me? Well, tell them that the Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob sent you. Tell them I, I've heard their cries and, and I'm, I'm doing something about it. Go tell them, Moses. You see? So it, Moses was appointed. Moses, go. I'm gonna, there's others, but I'm just going to give another one, the prophet uh, Amos. He said, it's, Amos is not ashamed to own before the king. He says, I, I was no prophet, neither was I a prophet's son, but I was a herdman and a gatherer of sycamore fruit. And the Lord took me as I followed the flock. And the Lord said unto me, go, prophesy unto my people, Israel. The plain shepherd was far more successful in his ministry than all the priests of Bethel. And why? Okay, why? Why? Roland, this is Roland's argument. Why? Because he had been sent of God. Okay? So so again, I hope I'm 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 you know doing a fairly decent enough job to give you the main points of the sermon, but but it's quite remarkable, don't you think? I mean, quite simply refreshing, quite biblical. Oh, yeah. Hey, Christian church, our job is to preach Christ and him crucified. Apostle Paul said, you know, there's only one thing I really want to know in my life. I count everything else as, as, as garbage. I, w I want to know him and the power of his resurrection, you know. I mean, that, that's what we desire, right? And, and I have to say to you, with the pandemic and everything else, and I'm sure others feel likewise i just want to let you know you're not alone that first off if your faith is strong and you're stirred i'm i am so happy for you and um and i want you to keep on brother and sister but i i have to say during this pandemic uh with uh, lack of church services um just the daily pressures um, there seems to be a lot of shining objects that kind of take our attention away from the Lord, and it has definitely impacted me. I mean, I, I can tell you the coldness within my own heart for God, for His Son uh, to be led by the Holy Spirit. You know, um, you know, I see the resistance within my own heart and the coldness within my own heart. You know, and so there's much, um, there's much to confess. There's much to seek God for as far as help. And um, so, but I want to encourage us all to be honest with God about where we're at spiritually. You know, and, and perhaps the way I could say it is Christ isn't enough for us. And that's our 
that's our challenge. That's our sin. That Christ isn't enough for us. We got to have all these other gimmicks and gadgets and many other things that we don't want to confess. You know, Christ isn't enough for us. We, we, we don't trust the scriptures anymore. We have to do something more. We have to, you know, we're acting like that river that's going over the banks, you know. We got to trust our own personality, our own speaking abilities. Uh, we we got to, you know, put on a, a facade, if you will. We've got to turn our church services into concert type feelings. And it grieves the Holy Spirit. Just like the coldness of my own heart and the challenges that I see within myself spiritually, um, you know, is, is, is certainly grieving God. So I, I myself personally have much to confess. And so I'm sharing this with you. If you if you like, man, John, we're in just spiritually tough times and I see it hurting my faith. Well, I just want to encourage you, brother and sister, that you're not alone, that you're not somehow going crazy. No, I, I get it. I get it. So what are we to do about it? Well, I, you know, I've given some practical advice, but I think we need to pray. And that's how I'm going to end this message. Gracious Heavenly Father, we come to you because we are your children and we need you. We know that we have committed many sins. And Father, we may have gotten to the point of cherishing secret sins, that our hearts have grown cold against you, against your Son. We resist the Holy Spirit. Father, I, I fear that we are becoming not only stiff-necked people, but diamond-hard people. So, Father, the work of the Spirit, the oil of gladness to soften our hearts, we need this very day, Lord. Lord, we know that there is more grace in you than sin in us. We see it in your word. We see it throughout all of history. And we confess, Father, I personally confess that Christ hasn't been enough. I've needed other things. Uh, things that are sinful and wrong, misguided. And so, Father, I ask you this very day to heal us spiritually, to help us see things the way that you see things. To help us not be led astray by idolatry. Um, to be led astray by shiny things. By the pressures of this world. By the schemes of the devil. So Father, we ask that you would rend the heavens and come down. That you would rot us, Lord. That you would shape us and form us. Father, I thank you for the fact that you bring about conviction so that we would know that we've gone off the narrow path. And so, Father, this very day, bring us back to us, back to you. Help us, Lord. I know, Father, that when we may not know how to get to you, you know how to get to us. And so that's what I pray this morning. That you would rend the heavens and come down. Convict us, O Lord. Shape us, form us. Keep us as your people. May we go back and treasure our first love, which is Christ himself. And all of God's children agreed by saying,